Welcome, welcome to Baha'i Chat, another episode, conversation series dedicated to our interconnectedness. It's an uplifting moment when we can turn our thoughts to spiritual ideas. Each session is rooted in Baha'i writings and the fundamental teachings of the oneness of God, the oneness of religion, and the oneness of mankind, led by individuals putting these principles into action. Our main program is an hour in length. At the end of that hour, we'll have a brief intermission respecting those who might need to sign off. We'll return from that intermission for a 30 minute Q&A where you can direct your questions to our panelists. You can write those questions in the Q&A at any time in the box uh, uh, below. We have no clergy in the Baha'i faith and one of our most fundamental teachings is independent investigation of truth. If you aren't already in contact with a Baha'i and would like a bit of virtual one-on-one -on -one accompaniment to begin such an investigation where you can ask questions, be guided to material that would especially resonate for you or be introduced to Baha'is and community building activities in your area, we invite you to connect with our Baha'i Guide program. You'll get a personal invite to connect in whatever virtual way you'd like it the time that works for you. For more details, simply send an email. We're putting this in the chat box now, info at Baha'i Chat, and write guide in the subject line. Baha'is believe that we are living in the great day of God, foretold by each of his messengers, the revealers of the major world religions. All of these divine educators are connected. Their messages are progressive, ever leading mankind forward to new levels of unity. Each has been the bearer of a preordained message essential for the times. God's latest manifestation and founder of the Baha'i faith is Baha'u'llah. That's an Arabic title meaning the glory of God. Baha'u'llah appeared in Iran in the middle of the 19th century. His overarching most essential mission is nothing less than the unification of the entire human race a reality promised in the scriptures associated with each of God's former messengers. In the words of Jesus Christ, for example, as recorded in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On the theme of our essential oneness, Abdu'l-Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah and the center of his covenant, the sole interpreter of his writings wrote this. In every century, a particular and central theme is in accordance with the requirements of that century confirmed by God. In this illumined age, that which is confirmed is the oneness of the world of humanity. Every soul who serveth this oneness will undoubtedly be assisted and confirmed. The Baha'i faith teaches the importance of the abolition of prejudice of all kinds. The Baha'i authoritative text singles out racism as the most vital and challenging issue facing American society. Today's topic is the life and times of Lewis Gregory. Mr. Gregory, an African-American attorney, one of the first black Baha'is in America, learned about the Baha'i faith in Boston and soon declared his belief in Baha'u'llah. Mr. Gregory considered Pauline Hannon and her husband, his spiritual teachers, and this is what he wrote to them on July 23rd, 1909. It comes to me that I have never taken occasion to thank you specifically for all your kindness and patience, which finally culminated in my acceptance of the great truths of the Baha'i revelation. It's given me an entirely new conception of Christianity and of all religion, and with it, my whole nature seems changed for the better. It is a sane and practical religion which meets all the varying needs of life, and I hope I shall ever regard it as a priceless possession. On March 25th, 1911, at the behest of Abdu'l-Baha, Gregory sailed from New York City to Egypt and Palestine for his pilgrimage. In Palestine, he met with Abdu'l-Baha and visited the shrines of Baha'u'llah and the Bab. The following year in 1912, at the age of 68, after some 60 years in exile and prisoner, Abdu'l-Baha, having finally been released by the Young Turk uprising, traveled to America. There, for 239 days, he gave hundreds of lectures held a myriad of meetings, and was featured in articles published far and wide across the country, reaching across political, religious, racial, class, and gender lines. He lovingly confronted Americans with a vision of human nature, social unity, and the nation's future 
that was 100 years ahead of its time. Among the most notable of Abdul Baha's encounters during this time were meetings he held with Louis Gregory. To lead us today in our discussion about the life and times of this extraordinary Baha'i, Mr. Gregory, is one of Baha'i Chat's favorite hosts, Dr. Laili Mapayan. A child of the South herself, Laili grew up in a Baha'i family, spending formative years in Georgia and North Florida. One of the most thrilling aspects of her childhood, she says, was her first visits to South Carolina's Lewis Gregory Baha'i Institute for summer and winter schools, experiences that left a deep impression on her. And now she's professor and chair of Africana Studies at Wellesley College in Massachusetts, where she also serves as executive director of the Wellesley Center for Women. Laylee, welcome to the chat. So nice to have you back again. Thanks, David. It's always great to be back. And I'm excited that this is our third show that focuses on the history of the Baha'i faith in South Carolina. I sometimes feel like even though I haven't spent that much time in South Carolina, that it's one of my spiritual homes because the few moments that I've had there have left such a deep impression on me. And I feel like after people listen today's, to today's episode, they'll, they'll understand why I feel that way. This history of Lewis Gregory that we're going to explore um, and talking about the museum is just uh, is going to be very intriguing. So thank welcome you home. Much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We have some wonderful experts lined up for today, actually, and um, I'd like to introduce them one by one. Just for starters, we have uh, Louis Venters. He's my old friend, as you well know, because we uh, co-hosted the first two shows about the history of the faith in South Carolina together a few months ago. But for those who are just meeting Louis for the first time today, Louis Venters, PhD, teaches African and African diaspora history, US history and public history at Francis Marion University in Florence, South Carolina. And he's a consultant in the fields of historic preservation and cultural resource management. As we've discussed on past shows, Louis is the author of No Jim Crow Church, the origins of South Carolina's Baha'i community, as well as the related book, A History of the Baha'i Faith in South Carolina. He's also authored or co-authored several site studies, public history reports and exhibits, including the multiple award-winning mobile guide to African-American historic sites, the Green Book of South Carolina. He's a member of the Board of Directors of Preservation South Carolina and an ex officio member of South Carolina African American Heritage Commission. Louis first encountered the Baha'i faith as a young teenager on Radio Baha'i in Hemingway, South Carolina. And since then, he's served in a number of capacities in the Baha'i community, locally, nationally, and internationally. He's lived, worked, and studied in Africa, Europe, and the Americas. He blogs on issues related to race, religion, history, and culture at louisventers.com. So welcome, Louis. Hey, thank you. Nice to be here. Looking Glad to have to you. Mm -hmm. All right, so now I'd like to introduce Al. Alonzo W. or Al Nesmith Jr. is the former director of safety, security, volunteers, and guest services at the Medical University of South Carolina Medical University Hospital Authority, from which he retired after 38 years of service. Al is famously one of the earliest African-American graduates of the Citadel, the elite military college of South Carolina. And in 1983, he was appointed by South Carolina Governor Richard W. Riley to the Citadel Board of Visitors, a position he held until 1989. After the Citadel, Al completed a master's degree in hospital and healthcare administration at the University of Iowa before returning to his South Carolina home. Al embraced the Baha'i faith on February 19, 1981. He served for several years as a member of the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Charleston. He also served on the Baha'i task force that created, licensed, and operationalized the first Baha'i radio station in North America, which we had just heard about through Louis's story, WLGI, also known as Radio Baha'i 90.9 FM. You might recognize that the call letters of that radio station stand for Lewis Gregory Institute, a Baha'i training institute that was established outside Hemingway, South Carolina in 1972. Dr. Alberta Deese, a South Carolina native of Adams Run, was the Lewis G. Gregory Baha'i Institute administrator during this period. Al also served on a Baha'i national committee promoting the equality of women and men. Through these many experiences and more, Al has become a local expert on African-American Baha'i history in Charleston and surrounds. In the recent past, Al has treated diverse audiences to lectures on this history, 
Just last month, for example, Al gave a lecture on the Baha'i tradition for the African-American Religious Diversity and Dialogue series of the Charleston Interreligious Council. In 2017, he shared the dais with Louis Venters for a talk very germane to today's topic, the Louis Street Gregory Baha'i Museum, making space for interracial unity in Charleston. So welcome, Al. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful to have you. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Danita Brown. Danita M. Brown, AIA, NCARB, is a licensed architect with over 30 years experience in design, planning, community development, and program management of varied construction types. After years of working in architectural firms and founding her own practice, she currently works in the Sunbelt Region 4 Office of the U.S. General Services Administration, or GSA, as the Regional Historic Preservation and Fine Arts Officer, responsible for ensuring preservation of historic buildings listed in or eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places, as well as management of the art and architecture program in new federal buildings and conservation of fine art in the region. Previously, she served as historical architect with the Southeast Region Office of the National Park Service, a unit of the U.S. Department of Interior focused on the preservation and restoration of historic structures in the park units on the campuses of historically black colleges and universities and with partners of historic properties. Danita completed both her undergraduate and graduate studies in architecture at Clemson University, where she returned to serve as an adjunct professor. She was the first African-American woman to be licensed to practice architecture in the state of North Carolina. She has served as a guest jurist and advisor at Georgia Institute of Technology College of Architecture, Savannah School of Art and Design, and Southern Polytechnic State University School of Architecture, and is a National Council of Architecture Architectural Registration Board's AXP intern advisor and mentor. Danita holds leadership roles in Atlanta, Georgia as past chair and vice chair of the city's Urban Design Commission, current member and chair of the city's Board of Zoning Adjustment, member of the Auburn Avenue Historic and Cultural Information Project Advisory Committee, member of the Sweet Auburn Works Design Committee, and founding member and former president of the Cascade Heights Community Development Corporation, a commercial district revitalization nonprofit organization. And I should say that's where my grandmother lives. So I feel personally connected to you on this point, Danita. In addition to all of this, Excuse me, Danita also serves the Baha'i faith extensively in numerous roles. She is currently deputy trustee of Hukukula, serving on the board of trustees in the US, Alaska, and the Turks and Caicos Islands. She's a member of the Southeast Regional Baha'i Council, as well as a member of the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Atlanta, Georgia. She is also a delegate to the Baha'i National Convention, as well as an active Ruhi tutor and animator. Previously, she served as an auxiliary board member for propagation in Alabama and Georgia. And germane to today's discussion, she served as chief architect for the restoration and rehabilitation of the Louis G. Gregory Baha'i Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. So welcome, Danita. Glad to be here. Thank you. Glad to have all of you. So we have an exciting show planned today. We're going to first focus on Louis G. Gregory as a historical figure and then turn our attention to the museum. So I'm going to launch today's conversation with one simple overarching question to Louis. Who was Louis G. Gregory? Well, I, as, as y'all know, I could talk about Louis Gregory for days on end. Um, and this question, who, who was he? Um, I think is something that as a scholar and as an individual, as a believer, as a South Carolinian, the more I study him, the more I reflect, um, the older I get, the more I raise children, the more I appreciate the various dimensions of, of who he was. And I think even from, um, a, as a young Baha'i, I had a pretty good sense and a good education from elders that we all stand on his shoulders. But that realization just gets um, deeper and deeper um, as I, I guess, as I interact with him more, right, um, through, through research and so forth. Um, so, so as, uh, as David mentioned, um, the, the American dilemma of racial prejudice is, has, has been since the beginning, um, the, one of the main focal points of Baha'i belief and action in the United States. 
the, the, the fundamental principle of the oneness of humanity that animates all the teachings of the Bab and Baha'u'llah has particular implications for how the Baha'i faith grew up in the United States. Um, the biggest barrier, one could say, to realizing this vision of the oneness of humanity in the United States is, is racial prejudice and, and division. And Lewis Gregory is probably the, the, the single individual in the United States who did the most during his life to ensure that the very young Baha'i movement in the United States grew up on very sound, committed interracial lines. Uh, he, he first encountered the Baha'i faith in Washington, D.C., where he was living uh, in 1909, um, and was one of the, the early African Americans who encountered the Baha'i faith and, and ultimately embraced it. And it was at a moment when, as we've discussed in, in previous, uh, previous shows, it was a moment when everything in American society is moving in the direction of racial hierarchy, division, codifying Jim Crow in various ways in the South and across the country. And here's the Baha'i community that's just arrived in the United States and trying to figure out its way. And Louis Gregory is, is one of those who helped in, to ensure that um, um, Baha'is of all backgrounds and, and the culture of the Baha'i community in the United States is, uh, is, is very firmly on the side of justice and unity and, and eliminating racial barriers. So talking about him um, today uh, remains relevant because the, um, the, the, the questions he wrestled with about how to take the, the vision in the writings, in the teachings of Baha'u'llah and apply them in real world circumstances the questions that, that he was dealing with in the Baha'is of his day and Americans in general of his day uh, were dealing with are the same ones that, that we struggle with in somewhat different circumstances you know, more than 100 years later. So I find in his life um, such wellsprings of wisdom and, and experience. And I think that um, we certainly in the United States and in general, we stand in dire need of um, of more heroes, more people who have, you know, pointed the way with their lives to, to the kind of country that, that we need. So with regards to our topic today, we're trying to get to the museum, right? So I want to place Mr. Gregory um, first in, in, in his place of origin, right? Um, he is very much a child of Reconstruction. He was born in 1874. Um, just less than a decade after his parents were uh, freed from slavery in um, Darlington County, South Carolina, uh, which is just very close to where I am now. Um, in fact, the, the plantation where his mother and grandmother uh, lived, where they came from, um, is about five miles um, from my house, very, very close by. Um, and uh, the family was among the, the stream of African-Americans who left rural areas in South Carolina. And really this happened across the South in the decade and, and more after the Civil War um, and moved to cities. Um, when, you know, later on, we talk about the great migration as African-Americans um, leaving the South and going to the North and the West. But the first migration of, of Black people after the Civil War was from rural areas to urban areas in order to flee um, violence in, in a lot of cases. Um, and that was certainly the case in, in, the, uh, in Lewis Gregory's family. Um, and also because urban areas represented more opportunity, more educational and employment um, opportunities. So, um, so Mr. Gregory's older brother was born uh, in the country uh, at, but the second son, um, Lewis, was born in Charleston, um, in, in the city. Um, and um, his, uh, one of the great influences that he talked about later in his life, I think she's really uh, important to, to talk about, is, was his grandmother, his mother's mother. Um, and uh, without going into 
the, too much detail because he writes a lot about her. Um, he, he says that uh, one of the greatest gifts that his uh, maternal grandmother gave him was the gift of laughter. That she had a way about her of, you know, in, in whatever the situation was, no matter how dire the circumstances were, she was the one in the family who had the power to, to turn it around and, and, and get people to, to laugh, to, to lighten the load, right? Um, to, to, to make it possible to, to keep going. Um, and when I say some dire circumstances, I do mean dire circumstances. Charleston um, was a majority black city in the decades after the Civil War. The population was, was really increasing. Um, it was kind of a swampy mess before emancipation, but with more and more people coming into it and, and, and neighborhoods springing up in, in, on soggy ground, there was, there was not a a, a proper sewer system or water system in Charleston until until after Mr. Gregory was grown up and gone. Uh, Mr. Gregory also uh, spoke a great deal about his uh, his stepfather. This is Mary Elizabeth George Gregory, uh, his mother, and uh, and on the right is George Gregory, his stepfather. Um, his mother re remarried uh, after his, his father died and, uh, and Mr. Gregory became a loving father, he said, uh, to his stepchildren. And if you see, um, if you can see really uh, small written on the, the photograph of his stepfather, uh, it's, it's Colonel George Gregory. Um, uh, Mr. Gregory explained that, um, that his stepfather was not a real Colonel. He said he was a Southern Colonel. Um, what that means is that this is a term of great respect that was given uh, to the elder Mr. Gregory um, because he had served in the Union Army um, towards the end of the Civil War. Um, and uh, th that appellation colonel was a mark of the respect that, um, that he had in his community. Um, and so these people, I think it's really important to, to, to say they, they gave their children the very best that was uh, possible in terms of education. Um, the, the boys benefited from the first public education system that South Carolina had ever had, uh, passed by um, uh, the Reconstruction government. Um, and then they went on to um, Avery Institute, which was actually a, a college prep private school um, just a few, few blocks away. Um, uh, Mr. Gregory went on to uh, Fisk University in uh, Nashville. He came home to Charleston for a couple years after his graduation, and he edited a newspaper. Uh, he taught for a little while at, at Avery, his alma mater. Um, and then he went to D.C. to, uh, to law school, and he graduated um, from the Howard University Law School when, at the turn of the 20th century, there were about 2,000 African-Americans in 1900 who had a university degree out of a population of 9 million. Um, and, and Mr. Gregory in 1900 had a law degree on top of that, right? So um, when, when W.E.B. Du Bois popularized this idea of the talented 10th, right? That, that minority of educated African-Americans who would be able to, uh, to, to advance the race and making space for others, educating the rest, bring, bringing, bringing the whole 9 million along, um, Lewis Gregory was definitely a, a part of that calculation, a part of this, uh, this, this elite of African-Americans who had the best that the country had to offer and had this responsibility on their shoulders to turn around and, and make a difference, right? If they got their education, if they had doors open for them, then their, their job was to open doors for, for everybody else. So he worked at the Treasury Department in Washington. He was a federal civil servant. He described working in an office in, in the legal department with two old uh, white Civil War veterans. One was a Confederate veteran. One was a Union veteran. Uh, they loved each other and kind of hated each other. They got into arguments all the time. And he said that, you know, he was this young guy and would sometimes um, on purpose 
say something that would get the two of them going, right? Um, and so uh, he, he said that one of them was who first introduced him to the Baha'i faith. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, it was the Confederate veteran who said, you young man, you, you agitator, you activist, you need something to, to, to settle your mind and to give you some, a, a better perspective. You need to go find out what these Baha'is are uh, talking about. And it, Mr. Gregory said later that he, um, <laughs> he went mostly to do his old friend, his colleague a favor. I sort of get the impression in what he wrote that it's a Southern way of um, doing what the person asked, just to sort of get him to leave you alone. So he went to this Baha'i meeting, um, not really expecting to find anything useful because he, he grew up in a religious home. He went to religious schools. He was a lot like Du Bois at this point, who believes in the spirit at some level knows that religion in general, there is a God and there is justice in the world, right? There must be. But Mr. Gregory has sort of given up on religion as he knew it as, um, as a solution to the practical problems of the world. Um, so he went to the Baha'i meeting um, ready, to, uh, ready to dismiss it and found that he couldn't dismiss what he heard. Um, he studied the faith uh, in a, with an, in a number of homes with um, black and white Baha'is um, for more than a year. Uh, and finally, as we saw uh, in, in 1909, same year that the NAACP was founded, he committed himself as a Baha'i. And this is, the, this is the letter that he got back from Abdul Baha after um, sending off his own profession of faith. Uh, this is the mandate uh, that Abdul Baha gave to Louis Gregory that, that shaped the whole rest of his life. Um, Abdul Baha said, I hope that thou mayest become the means whereby the white and colored people shall close their eyes to racial differences and behold the reality of humanity. That is the universal unity which is the oneness of the kingdom of the human race. I, I think the, the, the phrasing is so, um, is so penetrating. Um, the means by where, whereby the white and colored people shall close their eyes to racial differences and behold the reality of humanity. That is the universal unity, which is the oneness of the kingdom of the human race. Rely as much as thou canst on the true one and be thou resigned to the will of God so that like unto a candle thou mayest be enkindled in the world of humanity, and like unto a star thou mayest shine and gleam from the horizon of reality and become the cause of the guidance of both races. So Mr. Gregory received this uh, uh, letter from Abdul Baha and uh, took it as the blueprint uh, for the rest of his life. Um, he uh, traveled extensively around the United States uh, for the, uh, until um, the late, late 1940s um, when ill health prevented him from doing so. He traveled to 46 states, uh, parts of Canada. Uh, he and his wife um, uh, lived for some time in Haiti to try and help establish a Baha'i community there. Uh, he became one of the, the, the most um, seasoned traveling teachers of the Baha'i faith in the United States. He went everywhere and um, was not at all afraid of using his status in the Talented Tenth to get on the speaker's platform in, in all kinds of situations. And um, every place he went, in the South, in the North, in the West, he sought out uh, African Americans of all of all stations of all backgrounds, and he sought out progressive-minded whites, um, and did everything in his power to help build conceptual bridges uh, between them. Because of his influence, um, uh, prominent African Americans um, and a, a a very large portion of the, the, the reading public uh, of African-Americans in early 20th century United States, they became acquainted with the Baha'i faith. 
um, it, at, at this sort of critical moment for the development of the civil rights movement and the aspirations of African-Americans, um, Mr. Gregory was, was there fertilizing, pollinating, sharing the Baha'i teachings with those who were on, on the front lines of this work and also sharing what African-American activists and builders of community were doing, sharing all of that with, with the Baha'is as well. He was a, an author. He wrote quite extensively um, in Baha'i publications. He was, um, as an attorney, he was on the committee of people who helped um, uh, write the national Baha'i constitution and bylaws that then served as a pattern for national Baha'i communities around the world. Um, he was the first person of African descent to be elected to a Baha'i administrative body. Um, the embryonic local spiritual assembly in Washington. Um, and then just the year after that in 1912 um, to the embryonic national spiritual assembly. And he served in that capacity um, uh, a total of 16 uh, years um, until, uh, until late in his life. He visited everybody uh, across the country, small Baha'i groups, uh, large Baha'i groups. He, uh, was a frequent um, uh, lecturer, um, teacher at uh, the Baha'i school in, in Maine, um, Greenacre. Um, and in fact, that's where he passed away uh, in 1951. This is Louis Gregory uh, in the 1930s um, with the eight other members of the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States and Canada. And if you have a good eye, um, you'll see that they're standing in front of one of the pieces of the Baha'i House of Worship that's under construction. That's some of the, the lacy exterior concrete um, that I, I just have to point out the, the sparkly in the concrete uh, of the House of Worship in, uh, in Wilmette, um, that was quartz that was mined in Spartanburg County, um, South Carolina. So, so Louis Gregory helped build um, our national Baha'i temple in Chicago. Um, and they did it with, with rock that came from his home state. I, I, I have to say, this is Louis Gregory with, um, with Baha'is and friends in Columbia, South Carolina, probably about 1944, a racially integrated group. Um, and he's there to encourage and to deepen them um, and to bring back news of what they're doing to the rest of the uh, to the rest of the national Baha'i community. Um, Laley and David mentioned the Lewis Gregory Baha'i Institute. Um, here's one photo of uh, a group uh, in front of the, the sign out front of the Lewis Gregory Institute, early 1970s, um, when, when tens of thousands of mostly rural African-Americans became Baha'is starting in 1970, and there was a need for a facility a, a permanent place to be able to train more teachers and administrators of the faith in the South, uh, it was only appropriate um, that it be named uh, after Louis Gregory, um, who is the one who most uh, laid the, the groundwork for that being possible. Um, so, so I don't think that's um, enough of an answer to the question of who is Lewis Gregory, but that I'll, I'll contain myself. Thank you, Louis. That was a phenomenal introduction, uh, particularly for people who are coming into this not having heard of Lewis Gregory before. Um, but you've also given us a really strong platform for understanding the significance of getting a museum to honor Lewis G. Gregory and the legacy of his work. So I'm going to now uh, transition us to a discussion about the museum itself. And there are a lot of stories to tell about how it came into being and what it does. And so I'm going to start now by turning it over to Al and Danita to tell us the story of how the Louis G. Gregory Baha'i Museum came into being. And I know that Danita, you have some particular background about the community um, and the history of just the space there before we even get to the part about Lewis Gregory um, and his family home there. Would you like to start by offering some of that background? Yes, because you know our environment shapes us as much as we shape our environment. Um, 
you know, Charleston um, was the portal for enslaved Africans. And I think Louis mentioned that the turn of the century, the majority of uh, people who lived in the city of Charleston were of African descent, either free or enslaved Africans. And so when we think about the development of the city, um, this particular court, there was a series of, of not only streets, but a series of what we call alleys and courts. And this court was a place that had already always been home to African, um, whether enslaved or free Africans. And so uh, actually in 1854 um, was when the court was formed. It was part of an ownership by a white uh, property owner, uh, and he had a son of mulatto or mixed race. His name was Jacob Weston. And so Mr. Weston bought this property. It was sold in auction, and it had been dominated um, as part of a, a, a cluster of homes. And so if you, when we see photos later on of this court, there were 45 families at the time who lived in this one little court. 45 families. And the house, two deportes, deportes is one of the, the homeowners that live in this court, is eventually um, put in their name, the court name. But two deportes court is where Mr. Jacobs owned the property. He would rent it out. And except for two families of the um, six, of the 30 or so families that lived in this house, um, Oh, except for two, they were all of African descent. And so in 1881, quote, Colonel George Gregory purchased the house from the widow of Mr. Weston. And uh, when he purchased the house, of course, Louis Gregory, his mother, his brother, they lived in this house and this is where Mr. Gregory grew up. And uh, in, 18, uh, in 1989, Elwood Moore, that's when the, the house uh, was purchased by the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Charleston. It had um, left the hands of Mr. Gregory's family for a while. It had gone into some type of company name. It was continuing to rent it out. And then uh, a gentleman who was a member of the spiritual assembly um, noticed the address uh, of this property that was for sale. And that's how the Baha'is uh, um, became owners of the property. So maybe Al would like to pick it up from here and share a little bit more. Well, we, Go ahead, Al. Yeah, um, briefly, um, at that time in 1989, I was on the assembly of Charleston and there was a, a member on the assembly, Henry Wakefall, who's a native of Charleston, I'm a native of Charleston. And we would talk quite frequently about properties and Henry had a great passion for property and ownership. And he had one day said that, you know, Mr. Gregory's house is down on this for this court and it's not for sale, um, but I'm gonna keep my eye on it. And what he did was he befriended the people that were living on the court at that time. And as a matter of fact, one of the professors in sculpture became a friend of Henry's. He's about five houses from, this, from, from the, um, the museum itself. And he helped Henry watch when, for this, when this property was going to come online. As a matter of fact, when it came online, he called Henry. He said, Henry, that property is for sale. It's for sheriff's sale. And Henry called me and says, Al, the house is for sheriff's sale. I'm going down to get it. And so 1989, we got it. The assembly um, purchased the property. Um, and Henry was elated, and, but he never stopped working. Um, I remember being a delegate to the National Convention. Uh, the following year, and Henry was there uh, because he was not happy that the uh, lane for this border's court was not paid. And um, he started coming to national conventions and he asked the Baha'is to contribute. And the assembly can uh, work in concert with the city of Charleston. And the mayor of Charleston at that time was uh, Richard, uh, um, Dr., uh, Mr. Riley, and they all consulted and they came together and they created this borders court, which is a brick um, uh, walkway and driveway that is was restored and is beautifully done and standing today. And that's the brief history and, um, and it's a labor of love. And as you can see, I am sitting here um, 
with the, at the portrait of Mr. Gregory. And this house is really a house of love. Um, the portrait here was done actually by a local Baha'i artist that's from the Mount Pleasant community. Her name is Nina Uccello. And this is actually a depiction of her rendition of Mr. Gregory's photograph that's on the cover of his biography, To Move the World. And this has been in this house for since its inception and since its actually um, dedication in 2003. And we thank uh, Nina very much. And we also thank all of the highs from around the nation who contributed to those bricks that made this Borders Court as fashionable as it is today. Thank you, Al. You know, we have both some video and some photographs that uh, will show the audience exactly what you and Danita have been talking about. Um, I'm thinking that it would be good to show the video that shows the brick walkway, and then we can return to some of the pictures that show the condition of the house when it was acquired so that people can come to appreciate the work that was done to turn it into a museum. So, Josefina, if you could show the first part of the video, that would be great. This is a uh... Radcliffe or Faro, Desportis Court, the court that houses the childhood home of Hand of the Cause of God, Louis G. Gregory. This court is very interesting because it has lots of historical significance. This court was built specifically for freed blacks um, right after the Emancipation Proclamation. And number two, Desportis Court housed Mr. Gregory during his formative years when he attended Avery Institute, the normal school that was built for uh, the freed slave children. And Mr. Gregory, the distance from right here to normal, the normal school, Lewis Street Gregory School, which is Avery Normal School, is exactly 0.5 miles. Mr. Gregory walked to his school every day. Very nice walk, very historic walk, and it even passes the home of Denmark Vesey. This walkway was actually the first project that the Assembly of Charleston undertook with the city of Charleston, where we collected funds, Baha'is don donated to this, and we created this brick walkway. When we first acquired this home, this whole lane was dirt, and, and, um, and it got very messy. So this is one of the first improvements that um, the assembly, the local spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Charleston made in conjunction with the city of Charleston. This board is Court Brickway. Hello and welcome to the childhood home of Louis G. Gregory. This is the Baha'i Museum, the Louis G. Gregory Baha'i Museum. And we are going to take a tour today. We are going to see many photographs and artifacts um, within the childhood home of Louis Gregory. Come on in. All right, so that's just the first part of the video. We're gonna show a little bit more later, but for now, let's return to the subject of what it takes to transform that home into a museum after it was acquired by the Baha'is of Charleston and you know, to walking us through what it later became. I know there's both some photos. Danita, can you start us off on that story? I know you're very- Yes. Much. So, you know, I was a young architect, just graduated from Clemson and um, blessed that the spiritual assembly would reach out to me. Actually, Henry and I were friends and he owned property in Charleston, as Al mentioned, he's from Charleston. And I remember that um, I would go to his home and his property was a corner uh, two-story, not a Charleston style with the side porch, but it was more a corner block um, building. There was a store below and he and his family lived above. And so he would share with me the story that they, you know, of purchasing this house. So I had a chance to just go there and I didn't know a lot about historic preservation at the time, but I knew that we had to do what we could to preserve some, a lot of the original material, if we could, on the house. And there was a Baha'i uh, couple of European descent. They were travel around the country and work on Baha'i properties. And so they came and they did primarily most of the construction work to stabilize the building. 
uh, and but yet to retain as much as we could of the historic fabric. So you have this two-story gable front narrow house that where the gable front faced the court. And then you had these two side porches and balconies, the porch and balcony. And that's a traditional Charleston uh, style. It allowed for uh, the breeze to be able to, um, to connect breezes from both the top, the second floor and the first floor. And they worked on the building uh, architecturally and through the construction. And so um, that was really quite an effort to see because whenever you're working with older building historic properties, there's always something that's going to come up to that's going to impact um, you know, this, the constructability of the house. So it was interesting to be a part of that process. Can you say anything about some of the challenges that occurred in renovating and restoring that house? Well, um, I, if I remember correctly, they, there were some structural issues. So we had to really, I don't know if that photograph was there, but we really had to replace a lot of the wood members because of some of the water damage that had occurred on it. We had to, um, uh, of course, go through the city of Charleston Historical District because this house is in the National Historic District, District of Charleston. We had to create plans to present to the historical uh, society to get their approval. Um, so it wasn't an easy task, but it took, I think we worked on this property for about two or three years. Al, I don't know if you remember, but it, it took a while for us to get to the point where it was such that we could have the dedication of the, uh, of the building itself. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Al, maybe you will pick up the story there and talk about um, the point where it was completed and dedicated, and then we can return to the second part of the video. Yes, I just briefly can share that um, it took about 14 years for us to um, get the property to the point that we can have a dedication one day before Valentine's Day in 2003, February the 13th. And um, we had quite a crowd. Um, the News in Coria, the Charleston local newspaper, did a story. And um, it um, actually documented that there were over 150 people in attendance from all over the United States. And in some cases, I think they made reference outside of the United States. And they share the fact that it was dedicating a house to a prominent native Charlestonian, Mr. Louis G. Gregory. And it was a very joyous day, it was a beautiful day, a brilliant sunshiny day. The whole lot was smiling on us on that day. And we really appreciated the efforts of all of the Baha'is and the architects that did the, the architecture, that did the drawings and um, put this all together. And, and this house has served and created so much joy for Baha'is that come and visit. It is a small dwelling, but the spirit in this dwelling is just immense. Thank you, Al. And I know that you and Louie both have talked to me about how there's something unique about this museum relative to all the other museums in Charleston. Do you all want to mention that fact to our audience? So, so for those who aren't familiar with Charleston, I mean, this is a, a you know, one of the old colonial cities in, in North America. And um, in a lot of ways, this is where the historic preservation movement in the United States was, was born. Um, so so basically, downtown Charleston is one great big museum. Um, as as Danita was saying, you know, the, famously, you you can't you can't repaint your house without getting approval because because the fabric of the city is so important. So it's a it's a museum city, and then within it there are so many um, house museums. Um, all of the other museums, it, it, I, I may be mistaken. Maybe some some has come online that I'm not aware of, but but the 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 gist of, of these other house museums is that the, the, the museum is about the house and about the furnishings inside. Um, and, and this museum is the first one that is entirely dedicated to the life and work of an individual that's associated with the property, um, much less an African-American. Um, so it's a real landmark for the city of Charleston and, and you know, as our country is, you know, every day we see more evidence of more and more people having to come to terms with the legacy of slavery and emancipation and Jim Crow. 
um, for, for there to be this, it's tiny, you know, it's easy to miss if you're not looking for it. Um, but the Lewis Gregory Museum is a, it's a, it's a, it's a really unique spot in this city um, that is about interpreting reconstruction and the most great reconstruction, uh, the Baha'i faith as, as Lewis Gregory um, termed it. Um, and the other thing oh, I, I wanted to point out um, about the sign, the, the museum is so, as Danita was explaining, it's, it's, it's really embedded in its community. Um, and one of the things that we're proudest of and most grateful for is the, the sign, um, which was crafted by um, Philip Simmons, who uh, he passed away in 2009. Um, and he was widely acknowledged as the, the keeper of the Charleston wrought iron tradition. Uh, he was an African-American who was you know, from a long line of blacksmiths in Charleston. Um, when you go to all those other house museums, the fancy places, all the wrought iron uh, was made by these African-American craftsmen. And it's, it's one of the distinctive things about Charleston. Um, and so it's, uh, it's really wonderful that that tradition, um, you know, that art, that beauty wrought by black hands is, uh, is represented here with this, with this sign. Um, and you can, uh, yeah, that's, that's those curly cues, those beautiful, that's, um, that's Philip Simmons's work. Um, and um, the, um, you know, there's, there's other ways that the museum has been recognized by, by the city and, and cultural arts organizations. And it's, um, so it's, it's, it's run by the Baha'is, um, but it's really as a service to the entire community. And, um, and it's really, uh, really about connections with the, the whole community. We'll show the second half of the, the short video and talk more about the artifacts during the Q&A period after the break, because um, just to respect people's calendars, um, there are a few things that we like to say right before the break. You know, I want to uh, thank everyone who came to today's program. And if you have never been to the Louis G. Gregory Museum in Charleston, you might want to stay on after the break to see what it's like on the inside and to learn more about it, especially in case you think you might ever have the opportunity to visit. But for those who might need to sign off at the one hour mark, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, and I just want to offer a few announcements on behalf of David before we break. So again, if you aren't already in contact with the Baha'i and would like a bit of virtual one-on-one, -on -one, we invite you to connect with our Baha'i guide program. You'll get a personal invitation to connect in whatever virtual way you would like at a time that works for you. For more details, simply send us an email at info at Baha'i.chat and write guide in the subject line. Our next regular Baha'i chat program two weeks from today on April 10th will be Kinship of the Bible and the Quran. Our guests will be Imam Kamruz Hussein and Baha'i author Ted Brownstein, who will team up to present a dynamic discussion on the rich heritage shared by Jewish and Islamic holy books as branches of the Abrahamic tree. Topics covered will include the names and nature of the divine, advocacy of peace, common threads in sacred narrative and debunking stereotypes. Imam Kamruz and Ted are both experienced interfaith leaders. You can get more details about these and other programs access all of our previously edited Baha'i chat sessions and sign up to stay in the loop by receiving our regular newsletters. We're posting the link to the Baha'i chat website now in the chat box. So with that being said, let's take a three minute break and reconvene at 3.15 for more about the Louis G. Gregory Baha'i Museum. Coming for the 
good stuff ahead. You know, if you were, uh, if you didn't step away from your computer, you might have had a chance to hear some of that really cool, and beautiful music. And uh, I wanted to ask Louie to tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Um, the, for the for the musical intro and, and interlude today, we picked some, uh, some spirituals, uh, which are part of the musical heritage of Mr. Gregory, um, that he certainly grew up with in his ears all the time. Um, really um, one of the, the great creations of the Gullah Geechee people of South Carolina and Georgia. Um, and actually some of the recordings uh, were from, were old recordings from the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Um, so those are, that's the choir from Fisk University where Mr. Gregory uh, was a student that first popularized um, at the time that, you know, the, the, it was under the title Negro Spirituals. Um, and so that's the, the kind of choral version uh, that went around the country and around the world. So we just wanted to, to uh, have some of the flavor of, uh, of Charleston and the, the Southeast Coast and this spiritual heritage that, um, that Mr. Gregory brought with him into the Baha'i community and, and into his work in the world. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, it's interesting that, um, I, at least I know when I was growing up, that a lot of those old spirituals were reworked into Baha'i songs, and that sometimes at our Baha'i gatherings, uh, yeah. we would sing songs with similar tunes and um, slightly change words, you know, so it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear those things again. So I know that for the people who are here, they'd love to take that second peek into the museum. So maybe we could kick off with the video clip and then have a conversation about what's inside the museum, how the museum has been used and uh, more information for people who might like to visit the place. Right below it is the pupil of the eye, which documents the fact and all laws reference to the African-Americans um, and a world order of Baha'u'llah as a pupil of the eye through which everything is before them and they can see the reality and the light of the spirit shines through. Everyone's eyes might be different colors, but the pupil is dark and it attracts the light. The next set of artifacts that we have it documents Mr. Gregory's notoriety with the Intelligentsia of that time, Mr. Gregory was considered one of the talented ten. And the reason why he, that term was actually used is because during the time of Mr. Gregory's life, we were, they were only out of slavery some 20 to 15, 25 years. And the African Americans were trying to determine how to make this life and live as African Americans, free people in America. And when Mr. Gregory became a Baha'i, he spoke to Mordecai Johnson, 
president of Howard University. He had um, conversations and correspondence with uh, George Washington Carver at Tuskegee Institute. He also made contact with quite a few others as these documents show. You got the Cheney Training Institute, you have the, the Glidden Company, you have the College of Education and Industrial Arts at Wilberforce University, Charles H. Wesley, and Percy Gillian at the, the Glidden Company, who was the director of research, great friend of Mr. Gregory. And each of these letters, and this is the example of Mr. Gregory and his veracity for teaching. He, he's always talking about something he shared with them or given them related to the cause of Baha'u'llah and this message. Mr. Gregory served on the national body of the Baha'is um, of the United States for some 14 years. And here's a photograph of him. And I think he served as secretary for at least four to five, six times as secretary of the National Spiritual Assembly. Below that photograph is some correspondence between uh, Mr. Gregory and the Guardian, Shogi Effendi. And um, I usually tell people at this point that Mr. Gregory and um, Shogi Effendi, the Guardian of the Baha'i Faith, worked on a number of different projects together. And I understand that Mr. Gregory assisted Shogi Effendi in constructing the bylaws for the National Spiritual Assembly. And as you know, we are the community of Baha that actually help, is helping and assisting in bringing to fruition the Baha'i administrative order. Thank you. That was very helpful to get a peek inside. I'm just curious um, for those who might wonder just what it's like in the museum. We saw part of it and there were part of the video that we weren't actually able to show in the interest of time. You know, what's it like? How big is it? Is it, is it that one room? Are there other rooms? Are there other documents that people might encounter? Um, and what, uh, what feeling or impression of, of Lewis Gregory, Hand of the Cause of God, does one carry out of the museum after having that experience? I know all three of you experienced it and I'm waiting to. So this is much for me as it is for the rest of the audience. I'll share that the building is probably about 20 feet wide. And so the room that Al was in is kind of a, an open room. There's two rooms on that floor. Um, I believe that's the main meeting room and then a, maybe a kitchen that shares that uh, space. If you remember from the photographs, there was like kind of a block at the end of the building from the gable front. So that's about 20 feet, then maybe about 40 feet long. Mm. And then the stairs in that space, and it goes up to three rooms upstairs, including, I think there's a restroom upstairs and down. So it was a very, lots of during that time on these courts were very narrow and long. Mm -hmm. um, some people said it was done for tax purposes, but I think it was really done just for orientation of the environmental conditions mm -hmm. um, to catch those breezes to allow for um, outdoor space um, for um, that type of environment. But um, mm -hmm. 20 by 40, two stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not so, a lot of space for a family um, by by modern standards. Um, yeah, but but it's it, I mean that's I, but I think that's one of the things that you get from from the the building is is really putting putting yourself you know back uh, you know 150 years ago um, for for the the feeling of what it it may have been like then. Well, one of the artifacts is quite unique in the um, uh, in the building is a photograph that um, Rahia Kanum sent with a Baha'i from Haifa. Um, she was very happy that we had acquired the building and we were having the dedication. She sent a picture of um, the shrine of Baha'u'llah and she asked that it be placed into the um, museum. And the assembly decided that it would be placed um, above the complete photos of all of the hands of the cause of God. And mm -hmm. that is very moving. Mm -hmm. 
That's wonderful. You know, I'm going to start pulling from some of the questions that uh, audience members have asked. The first one says, is there a collection of Mr. Gregory's writings? Oh, I want to answer that question. Okay. Um, and the answer is not yet, but um, on my <laughs> on my scholarly bucket list um, is is that project because he really was an intellectual. Um, he really was a scholarly uh, man and um, was was recognized um, even before he became a Baha'i and, and shortly thereafter the press in Washington noted his oratorical um, abilities. They called him one of the finest speakers in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and he corresponded with everybody. I mm -hmm. think just his correspondence back and forth with Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois would be a, a, good, a good volume in and of itself. But mm -hmm. we really do need um, a collection of his, his correspondence and his writings, his essays, um, and, and, and to be able to contextualize it some in, in one volume, I think is a really important project. So whoever, uh, whoever asked that question, if you wanna help, um, find, find my email, we'll, we'll chat. Okay, and actually we got a very specific question that might relate to this. So I'm gonna read it. This comes from Fran Otto. Fran Otto says, uh, my name is Fran Otto from Kansas City, Missouri. I have recently started exploring artifacts of the early Baha'i believers here in Kansas City. The assembly was formed in 1935. I found a handwritten letter uh, from Lewis Gregory written to Edith Chapman, who is also mentioned in his autobiography. Edith was one of the first African-American women here in Kansas City. I've been meaning to contact National Archives, but now that I'm aware of this museum, I was wondering if this letter should be displayed in the museum. I will still contact National, but you may have an answer as well. Thank you for your consideration. Wow, that's great. Um, you know, as a, as a researcher and an archivist, one of the things, or, or having experience in archives now, um, I, one of the things that I have started to appreciate is that there are likely many, many more um, precious documents that, from, from Mr. Gregory um, all over the United States and Canada um, in boxes somewhere. Now, the, the National Behind Archives in Chicago really is the proper place for all the originals to be. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic operation there and they have the capacity with all the climate control and the, the, the proper documentation to, to guard these treasures um, mm -hmm. properly. And actually um, most of what's on the walls in the museum in Charleston is, is, is facsimile copies um, mm -hmm. because you know, we wouldn't want in, you know, next hurricane that comes through Charleston, we just couldn't couldn't let the originals be destroyed, right? Oh. Um, so, um, so wherever you are, if you are a local Baha'i archivist going through the oldest box that the local assembly has, keep your eyes open. And um, but the National Baha'i Archives in Wilmette is is definitely the place to start with. Um, but we can get a copy uh, in for for the museum. Okay, well, there, there are two related questions about um, Lewis Gregory's writings that I'm going to ask together. One comes from Judith Hope, who says, are there any of the articles or essays or other writings of Mr. Gregory available? If so, please point us to some of the titles and where they can be found. And thank you for this wonderful session. And then there's another person who asks, is there any place we can read the wonderful letter sent to him by Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi? Is it in the book to move the world? So people are curious, they wanna read more. So what's your best advice for how people can access the things that Lewis Gregory wrote or his cor correspondence with important figures in the faith? So um, there, a, a lot of his um, essays were for um, the, the Baha'i world that was the annual or biannual volumes that were prepared mm -hmm. under Shoghi Effendi's direction. Um, and so if you have um, access to, to a, a set of the Baha'i world, he's, he's all throughout uh, in, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and uh, the magazine, um, Star of the West, some of which is available online if you search, mm -hmm. uh, has a number of his, uh, his essays as well um, in, in you know, in one place though, no, there's not a there's not an online repository any more than there's a you know a, a physical copy of the collected works, um, and um, 
wait, what was the other question? Sorry, Lily. Oh, uh, the second question was just more uh, about how to read his correspondence with Abu Baha and Shoghi Effendi. Mm -hmm. Um, the uh, To Move the World is uh, the authoritative biography of Mr. Gregory. Uh, it's published in 1982, and um, it's it's still the, the gold standard. Um, and uh, Gail Morrison has a great deal of the correspondence um, with Abdul Baha and Shoei Effendi uh, in excerpted uh, in the book. So that's really it's it's indispensable reading, um, and it's it's. It's really a biography of the American Baha'i community as well in the first half of the 20th century, um, because Mr. Gregory was there in, from whichever angle you look at, at uh, how the community was developing and, and, uh, and how it was relating to questions of the day, uh, Mr. Gregory is there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I recommend the, the book, definitely. Right, that's great. Now I have a question I'm gonna to direct to Al since Al, you're sitting right there in the museum and I'm sure you can answer this question for Wendy Mating who says, the, does the museum contain any information on the interactions between Lewis and Abdu Baha during Abdu Baha's visit to the US, especially the story about the luncheon in DC where he demanded that Louis, Lewis sit next to him at the head table? And what can you tell us Al about that? No, we don't, we don't have that um, episode or that um, event. Um, but I share that um, if I'm doing a live tour and most of the guides will share um, those type of um, tidbits. Um, no, that is not included. Um, maybe that's something I'll ask the assembly if they might want to consider including some of his examples how to operationalize behind tenets and teachings um, that the that, um, master did when he's in America. Is the museum evolving in its collection of materials related to Lewis Gregory, or is it fixed? It, it, there's, there's a couple things. Um, the, the original exhibits um, from, from the materials that the local community was able to collect were um, very carefully prepared by a, a museum professional, um, Curtis Franks, who um, was working at that time for um, sorry, to, to digress, um, Mr. Gregory's alma mater, Avery Institute, uh, down, down the street, is today um, the Avery Center for, uh, Research Center for African American History and Culture of the College of Charleston. Um, so it's a, it's a museum and an archive dedicated to uh, to the study of Black Charleston uh, in, in particular. And so, so the, the exhibits were initially prepared uh, by, by this professional with a very, very sensitive eye. Um, one of the problems with um, modifying the exhibits very much is, is a simple problem of space. Um, there's just not anywhere else to go um, for, for additional, uh, additional interpretation. And so I, I think, um, one of the one of the best things is um, that is the interaction between the guide and and the, the the exhibits, right? So it's really meant to be a guided tour. Um, so what's not what we can't what we don't have room on the walls to put up um, really comes from the person who's lovingly guiding um, guiding a visitor. All right. Well, as I expected, there are a few questions from people who are either hoping to visit the museum or who aren't able to because of where they're located. Let me share their questions. Um, Edward Respes asks, this is one of my pilgrimage spots. Is it open all year round? So while I'm looking for the next question, maybe you can answer that one. Um, at the time with COVID, um, I think we take um, the um, tour request um, by um, online calls or whatever. And um, it will be with masks. Um, I think in a couple of months from now, um, I'll get my last shot tomorrow. And so, you know, um, everybody will have their, their uh, course. And so uh, things will be opening up more as the summer gets into um, play. But as of right now, everything is pretty much uh, shut down. Um, and we're looking at possibly in late summer um, where things will be open again in the assembly will actually put out some information to the Baha'i community at that time. Okay, that's great. And there was a question some, from some friends in Canada who said that they had come to Charleston and weren't able to see it because it was closed. And they're wondering if you're gonna make 
a video, an official video of the museum for people who are not able to see it in person? Um, I think that's something that um, I'll share with the assembly and um, we will try and make that happen with um, the assistance of our historical experts that reside in the state, that meaning Louis Venter. <laughs> uh, all right, now, Danita, I'm gonna direct this question uh, at you. Um, and this is a person, an anonymous attendee who asked, please forgive me if this was already answered, but what does hand of the cause of God mean? Oh, yes. So um, during the time of Baha'u'llah, the prophet out of the faith, you know, 18, uh, 50s through um, his ascension in 1892, and then Abdu'l-Baha and Shoghi Effendi, these were, the hand of the cause of God were devoted believers of the faith who were appointed by either Baha'u'llah, Abdu'l-Baha, Shoghi Effendi to propagate and protect the faith. And, you know, Baha'u'llah's rich religion pivots around the oneness of mankind. There's no denominations in the Baha'i faith. And so to protect the faith from schism, these devoted souls were appointed to protect the faith, but also propagate the faith throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Louis Gregory was appointed um, after his death. Um, he was not appointed during the time of the guardian, but we saw some precious notes that the, the guardian of the faith, Shoghi Fendi, sent to him. And so after his passing, he was appointed, he was elevated to the rank of hand of the cause of God. It's a lifetime appointment. Um, now, after the guardian, there were no uh, further appointments. Now the institution of the counselors, the continental counselors uh, who are appointed by the Universal House of Justice, they now are responsible for the propagation and protection of the faith of God. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. And we also have another question that sort of relates to propagation. Uh, Chris Wade asks, what information do we have about Willard McKay, Mr. Gregory's teaching partner? Um, here's a, there's a great deal about Mr. McKay um, in To Move the World. Um, and, and Mr. Gregory had an, a, a number of teaching partners at, at various points. I think basically, because most folk could only keep up with him for so long, um, so he got, he had partner after partner after partner. Um, and, uh, and there are uh, uh, some black and some white. Um, and some of the stories, um, a, a lot of which are in To Move the World are, um, are quite sometimes funny, sometimes uh, harrowing of, uh, of, of having a biracial team, uh, depending on where they were traveling. Um, and the other place that I would go uh, for Mr. McKay, I believe, is a, a, another book that's more recent um, called Champions of Oneness, Lewis Gregory and His Shining Circle by Janet Rue Schoen. And that's a, a, it's a different take. It uses Lewis Gregory as the central figure, but, um, but it's, a, it's a collective biography of the, these champions of interracial unity um, in the early 20th century. Um, and, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, the McKay's figure, figure in, in that book as well. Okay, here's a question and I don't know the answer to this at all. Are there any descendants from the brother of Lewis Gregory? Any nieces, nephews, or other extended family descended from the Gregory family who are still alive? That's from Judith Hope. I'm not the person who knows most about that. Um, but my understanding is that um, there are uh, there's step family of Mr. Gregory um, that is still alive, um, some in Charleston and some scattered around the world, um, and, uh, and 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 some some connection with them, some knowledge of of their illustrious um, forebear. When when Mr. Gregory's mother passed away, um, his stepfather. Colonel Gregory married again, and mm -hmm. those children became a part of Mr. Gregory's family. And he would often, um, when he would come back to Charleston for his teaching trips, he would stay with them. Uh, and so a lot of his letters from Charleston are, are from their addresses. Mm -hmm. And that's the Noisette family, the very famous um, Noisette family, which is part of um, refugees to Charleston from the Haitian Revolution. 
I mean, it's an, a complex and amazing story. If you've heard of the Noisette Rose, that's a, a, a kind of rose that's good for humid climates. Yes, that's that same family. Um, so especially those Noisettes um, are, are a extended family of Louis Gregory um, that he was very close to um, after his mother's passing. Thank you. Did any of you, uh, Al or Danita, have anything to add? Or are you, I, I couldn't tell if you. Exactly right. He did right. <laughs> yeah, I, I will share that we are working um, on a National Historic Landmark designation for this house because of the figure of Mr. Gregory. Mm -hmm. And so his family has expressed interest in being a part of that application process with the National Park Service. Mm -hmm. So we've been in touch with them through the research of that material, Mr. Lex Musta, I believe is his name. Mm -hmm. And so we are, we are aware of the family um, and in contact with them for, because of that National Historic Landmark uh, application. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Are there other national Baha'i landmarks in the country currently? Yeah, that's another thing. I have no idea. Are there some already? Would this be a first? I don't think uh, so. The, the temple in Wilmette uh, yes. is placed on the National, national Register of Historic Places. It's, a, it's on the yeah. National Register, yes. Okay. And uh, it, I, I don't know if Greenacre or one of the other um, cool. properties up north are, but for certain, the uh, House of Worship is on the National Register. And it is featured a lot of time in, in his architectural publications because of this unique concrete design mm -hmm. and of its form. So, um, yes. Okay, that's really cool. Well, let, let right. me tell another, just real quick. Um, sure. Also, and it's also telling a story on Danita. There's a new, um, one of the newest national parks is Reconstruction Era National Park um, in Beaufort County, South Carolina. Um, and uh, Danita was, uh, was a, an, an interim director um, a, a couple of years ago. Um, and so she may want to say more about this, but just briefly, um, it, it, some of the buildings that are now a part of this new national park to mark, um, it was called the Port Royal Experiment, one of the first places that the Union conquered in the South during the Civil War and where reconstruction policy was really started, tried out for the first time. Um, Penn Center is, is one of the sites associated with that, Brick Baptist Church. These are places that have, they're protected now by the National Park mm -hmm. Service as well, and um, have a very intimate connection with the development of the faith in the Southeast and in South Carolina because of how, um, how often Baha'is use the facilities mm -hmm. of Penn Center for mm -hmm. their interracial gatherings um, in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. So, so that's sort of an indirect way that it's a it's a Baha'i site or a site that's very dear to Baha'is that's that's we got in through the side door that way. That's interesting. I never knew that connection. I'm sure a lot of people find that interesting as well. All right. So we're getting into the last little set of questions here. Um, this is really pushing us ahead to the present and the future. And Judith Hope again asks, is the Lewis Gregor Institute used primarily as a museum or does the local community hold study circles and or other institute community building activities in it? Well, um, yeah, it's, it's used um, for um, events um, now that COVID, you know, things are down, but when the uh, COVID um, crisis is under control, um, we, we have, um, with the interfaith community, um, they call it um, spiritual branches, and you know, between the various um, uh, various sites of the various religious um, institutions that are in the group, and you have presentations. They tour the areas. Um, we've toured that whole group, and they visit. And then also, um, they have opportunities where they come and they ask for us to sponsor things with them, not necessarily at this site but at other sites, um, mm -hmm. have a smaller site. So you, you can't accommodate the big groups of the churches and the other things like that, so. Okay, great. Now, I know that we have a slide that shows some additional resources. Um, Janice King from Los Angeles says, does the museum have a bookstore and is it possible to purchase to move the world? So would someone please answer Janice's question so that she can get a hold of that important book? Um, the, the museum does not have a bookstore, um, really not, not the space to make that possible, um, at least at this time. Um, but, um, but on this slide, yes, there, there are um, several titles, including um, 
Like Pure Gold, which is a, a children's book about the life of Lewis Gregory, which is just beautiful. Um, but um, all, all of those are available through um, the Baha'i Distribution Service, um, baha'ibookstore.com. Um, and then we've also got um, the museum's website, um, which uh, includes a few photographs and a, a, a little bit of background to, to orient people and also contact information to book a tour. Um, and also um, there's the website of the Lewis Gregory Baha'i Institute, uh, which is the educational facility in Hemingway um, and Radio Baha'i as well. The radio station, I wanna point this out for our listeners far afield, um, the radio station that, that's named for Mr. Gregory is available anywhere in the world for streaming. Um, so go to that site and, uh, and get yourself hooked up with them. Um, our, our, it's a very local radio station, but it sure does go all the way around the world. And do you have any closing words, Al, Louie, and Danita? Thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. And you know, to study the life of Mr. Gregory during these times is just remarkable how he navigated all that he navigated. And so it can be a lessons and examples for us to also follow. Great words to end on. Thank you so much, Danita, Louie, Al, everybody. Great program. And to everyone who came today, join us again. Thank you.